combustion. And, you know, there are many theories. I mean, some theories are that the military already knows about these, uh, these forms of uh, propulsion and, uh, and lighter-than-air vehicles or, or metals that can be uh, vibrated to a certain point where they, they, become, uh, they become light waves, uh, photons. But they're not telling us. They're not going to reveal that, obviously, to us. And we just have to keep, keep the search going. So I, I think that uh, you know, it's incumbent on, on us as a race on this planet to begin to find alternatives to the, to the fossil fuels. Um, but we're just not doing it fast enough. It's probably been the greatest and most successful cover-up in the history of the world. UFOs are as real as the airplanes that fly over your head. That is my unequivocal conclusion. Oh my God. The Avro Arrow story, Dan, I mean, you appeared in a movie about the Avro Arrow story. Um, Canada broke the sound barrier. Diefenbaker dismantles the whole uh, aerospace program in Canada, and um, all the engineers are hired by NASA and Boeing down here, and we finally break the sound barrier. But in Canada today, we have another scientist, uh, Canadian scientist John Hutchison, is in using wave induction, using Van de Graaff and Tesla coils and radio, on a 75-pound cannonball, we can see this huge cannonball levitating in the air. I mean, um, Boeing, NASA, Lockheed, all of these defense contractors are going up into his lab in Canada and trying to understand how this thing works because the next person or the next country that figures out true anti-gravity propulsion systems um, is, going to be, is going to be king of aerospace on this planet. The Hutchison Effect incorporates radio frequencies, Tesla frequencies, and high electrostatic energy to create a type of levitation effect where it can move a 75 pound cannonball of steel or brass bushings, water, wood, and other objects into the air. Are we doing enough in our universities, in our in our uh, research labs, are we putting enough money into this kind of a research and what risks are we willing to take if universities in Beijing and China and, and Russia, they're actually going into the, universe, the UFO phenomenon in our universities, but here in America, mainstream science, mainstream physicists laugh at the UFO phenomena. I mean, what do you think about that? Budgets are tight all around the world and as far as putting money into the study of alternative technologies, of funding uh, research by people like Hutchinson, uh, the money is just not there. I mean, if you look at NASA, NASA is getting chopped back <clears throat> um, because uh, the funds that are, are, are flowing through government now are focused on the war in Iraq and, and other things. So we don't even have the money to keep up conventional uh, space exploration, uh, development of metallurgy, fuels, ion drive systems. So I don't see any government in the next, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years really uh, putting the money into uh, the kind of research that's, that's needed to develop these alternative systems and to perhaps study what is driving these intelligent machines from, from somewhere else. Uh, now, <clears throat> of course, that, that's on, the, on the, the visible side of things. We're hearing a lot about these special access programs where congressional money is approved by a very narrow uh, slice of the membership in the legislature and given to the military to do basically carte blanche what they want with. So there could be a black military program that is producing um, what, uh, what people are referring to now as the, the big black deltas which are these huge black triangles that uh, are being seen all around the world. The big black rectangles, which are also being seen all around the world. So maybe, <clears throat> maybe they look a little like this. the F-117, they look a little like the, B, uh, the B-2 uh, bomber. Um, maybe these uh, are special access programs that have been applied to alternative technology and energy and are really practically at work today. But I don't see... Uh, them revealing 
you know, these, uh, the sources of these programs nor their applications right now. Okay, I worked in the U.S. space program for 36 years. I was a contractor employee, first working for McDonnell Douglas and then ending up working for Boeing after McDonnell Douglas was purchased by Boeing. Uh, I started at the end of the Mercury program and then worked the whole Gemini program. And during Gemini, I was responsible for the design of the equipment uh, for the life support system. And so I had a distinct interest in keeping astronauts alive and having successful equipment. And during the program, when uh, we were flying the Gemini spacecraft, uh, my interest in UFOs became very real. It became real because, first of all, Gemini 2, which was unmanned, it was rumored uh, and talked about among our researchers that uh, uh, two UFOs had followed Gemini 2. And then uh, Gemini 2, of course, recovered later. And I didn't think too much about that except, yeah, that's kind of funny. Uh, very interesting stuff. And then when Gemini 4 flew and uh, its four-day mission, 66 orbits, with James McDivitt and Ed White, uh, about halfway through the mission, McDivitt said he has something up here with him. Astronaut Gordon Cooper is an American hero with a log of over 222 hours of manned spaceflight. He had a long and illustrious career of service to his country. With over 11,000 hours of flight, he was a fighter pilot, U-2 test pilot in the Air Force, and is one of the first men to ever fly in space. He orbited the Earth 22 times in Phase 7, the last of the Mercury missions, on May 15th and 16th of 1963. On August 21st of 1965, he orbited the Earth again on Gemini 5 and remained a backup for Apollo 10. Well, I, I've had uh, some occasions to know with some of the people who were involved in Roswell at one stage or the other. I think there's been an awful lot of untruths put out on Roswell and an awful lot of conjecture. I think there have been some truths in it. I think definitely there was something other than a weather blame there. Very likely. I'd like to think they reversed engineered it and did something with it. You know, did some benefit with it, which would be the logical thing to do, but I have no way of knowing whether they did or not. Within hours of the crash of Roswell, U.S. General Nathan Twyman designated the, vision, the visitors rather, as enemy aliens. It appears from his book that Colonel Corso agreed with that assessment, and that it has remained as official U.S. policy ever since. At that time, however, it was an enemy quote unquote, about which the U.S. could do nothing because the visitors were so technologically superior. That led to the recommendation that the discovery be treated with the utmost secrecy to the point that the crash of Roswell didn't happen and that UFOs don't exist. The rationale was that the ordinary public couldn't cope with the news and might easily panic. Well, Area 51, Dan, I mean, we hear stories from Bob Lazar, we hear stories about alternative space program theories, you know, we're building UFOs and reverse engineering UFO technology since the, cr the saucers crashed at Roswell and the plains of St. Augustine, and we have reverse engineered that technology today. That's the theory. And NASA is just a smokescreen program. If we really have true anti-gravity technology today, why aren't we using it in our military? Why isn't it evident uh, in the war in Iraq? Why don't we use it to, to demonstrate superiority on the planet? And if not, if, if all of this is just conspiracy theory, and we really don't have this technology, um, again, are we willing to take the risk of losing air superiority on this planet by letting the Russians or the Chinese um, and, or some other country, even the Middle East, um, actually engineer this kind of UFO technology and, and conquer the world. Are we willing to take that?